We're going to work today on interpreting RH phenotypes. And what we're going to do is work through the exercise that is on page 7 and 8 of the RH module. So at the top of page 7 it says interpret RH phenotypes. And there's a little bit of um, information there um, about determining what the genotype of a patient might be given their phenotype. So in this example, a patient's red blood cells have been reacted with common RH antisera, and the results are what's shown here. So their red cells were reacted with anti-D, and the reaction is positive, so agglutination. And the same with big C, big E, little c, little e. So therefore, on the patient's red blood cells, they have D, C, E, little c, and little e. So let's work together to figure out what the possible genotypes are of this patient and what the most probable genotype is. So what we're going to do is write at the top of a page the reactions for this patient. So this patient was positive with D, big C, big E, little c, and big E. And there is a Word document under content on Brightspace and in the RH module section that explains this exact same uh, problem, but we'll work through it together. So the first thing to do is to look at the big D. So when a person has the big D antigen, we have no way of knowing whether they inherited the big D from both their mother and father or just one of their parents. So we have a couple of options there. The patient is either big D, big D, or big D, little d. We have no way of determining which unless we did some family studies. So one thing that's really important when you see that big D pause, you have to remember to write down these two choices. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is the C's. Okay, so we're going to look at this C reaction and this C reaction, and we have to consider them together. So this particular patient has both big C and little c. So we're going to write those down. So we write the big C and the little c. And remember, I put a little bar on top of my little c just to make sure I remember that it's small. And I say to myself, would it have made a difference to put the little c first and the big C second? And it really wouldn't have. We would still have a big D with a little c and a big D with a big C. So I'm done with that choice. Let's move on to our second option. Put in a big C and a little c. And again, I say to myself, would it have made a difference to do it the other way around? Well, in this case, it actually would. So what I do is I write down that D situation that I had before I added the C's, and I do the opposite. So I put a little C and a big C. Okay, so now I've worked with the C's. Now I'm going to add in the E's, and I need to look at both reactions, my big E reaction and my little E reaction. They were both pause. So into these now so far, anyway, three options. I need to add big E and little e. Okay, so I start with my first option. I don't move down until I finish the first option. So I put in big E and little e. Now considering what was there before, would it have made a difference to put the little e first and then the big E? And I really think it would, because this is what I had before. And let's put the big E and little E in, in the opposite order. So little E and then big E. Those are two different things. Okay, on to the next. 
I have a habit, so I put the big letter first and the little. And then I say to myself, would it have made a difference to do it the opposite way? And indeed it would, because this is what I had there. And if I do little e first and big E second, I end up with something completely different in these two options. I move on to my last option. So I put the big E and the little e. And again, I say to myself, would it have made a difference to do it the opposite way? Little e first and then big E? And indeed it would. So now it's my job to determine which of these is the most probable genotype. They're all possible genotypes. Now in order to do that, I typically convert them into Weiner terminology because I find it easier to think in Weiner to tell you the truth. So what I'll get you guys to do is once you've got your choices, convert them to Weiner, write those choices down here, and then decide which is the most probable. And to do that, you can use the frequencies that are found on page 11 of the RH module. Some of these you may not be able to find on page 11, and that's probably because they're present in a very low percentage of the population. Okay, let's try one more. Let's try an easier one. I'm just going to move down the page here. So let's say that on the typing of the patient or donor cells, the D is negative. The big C is negative. The big E is negative. Little C is positive. And little E is positive. Remember that big C and little c are alleles, and big E and little e are alleles. So you can't be negative for both. That can't happen. You can be positive for both, which we found in the previous example. Okay, so let's give this one a try. So we've got negative for D. So what we write down then is little d, little d. Okay, because the patient is big D negative. They did not inherit the big D from either patient, from either parent, sorry. Notice that I write down the little d and I leave some space, a slash, and then a little d. And this is so that I can fit in the C's and E's. And the slash is denoting what was inherited from one parent versus what was inherited from the second parent. Okay, so now I need to look at the C's. Okay, so this particular patient is negative for big C and positive for big for little c. So that means they inherited little c from both their parents. So that makes it pretty easy. We just write down little c in both spots. And there's no other option, so we get to move on to the E's. So I'm going to look at the big E and the little E. And again, this particular patient is big E negative and little e positive. So they've inherited the little e from both their parents. And so in that goes. Convert to Weiner. This person is little r, little r. And that's a, actually a very common um, genotype. And it's also the most probable because it's the only option. The best way to get good at doing this is to practice it a lot. So do any example you can find in the module and be prepared to convert RH phenotypes to genotypes in the lab on Friday. And you must be able to do this independently. So without the help of um, the instructors in the lab. And 
you'll be doing this on the exam as well. You'll be given numerous phenotypes and be asked to um, determine the um, all possible genotypes and then determine which one is the most probable. So to do that, you're going to have to have some idea of your frequencies. I hope this helped.